Before the Sunday message today, we shall have a brief period of scripture reading. The Gospel according to St. John. The Gospel according to St. John. John 6. John 6. After these things, Jesus went over the Sea of Galilee, which is the Sea of Tiberias. And a great multitude followed him, because they saw his miracles, which he did on them that were diseased. And Jesus went up into a mountain, and there he sat with his disciples. And the Passover, a feast of the Jews, was nigh. When Jesus then lifted up his eyes, and saw a great company come unto him, he saith unto Philip, Whence shall we buy bread, that these may eat? And this he said to prove him, for he himself knew what he would do. Philip answered him, Two hundred pennyworth of bread is not sufficient for them, that every one of them may take a little. One of his disciples, Andrew, Simon Peter's brother, saith unto him, There is a lad here which hath five barley loaves and two small fishes, but what are they among so many? And Jesus said, Make the men sit down. Now there was much grass in the place, so the men sat down, in number about five thousand, and Jesus took the loaves, and when he had given thanks, he distributed to the disciples, and the disciples to them that were set down, and likewise of the fishes as much as they would. When they were filled, he said unto his disciples, Gather up the fragments that remain, that nothing be lost. Therefore they gathered them together, and filled twelve baskets with the fragments of the five barley loaves, which remained over and above unto them that had eaten. Then those men, when they had seen the miracle that Jesus did, said, This is of a truth that prophet that should come into the world. When Jesus therefore perceived that they would come and take him by force to make him a king, he departed again into a mountain himself alone. And when even was now come, his disciples went down unto the sea, and entered into a ship, and went over the sea toward Capernaum. And it was now dark, and Jesus was not come to them. And the sea arose by reason of a great wind that blew. So when they had rowed about five and twenty or thirty furlongs, they see Jesus walking on the sea, and drawing nigh unto the ship. And they were afraid. But he saith unto them, It is I, be not afraid. Then they willingly received him into the ship, and immediately the ship was at the land whither they went. The day following, when the people which stood on the other side of the sea saw that there was none other boat there, save that one wherein two his disciples were entered, and that Jesus went not with his disciples into the boat, but that his disciples were gone away alone, howbeit there came other boats from Tiberias nigh unto the place where they did eat bread, after that the Lord had given thanks, when the people therefore saw that Jesus was not there, neither his disciples, they also took shipping, and came to Capernaum seeking for Jesus. And when they had found him on the other side of the sea, they said unto him, Rabbi, when camest thou hither? Jesus answered them and said, Verily, verily I say unto you, Ye seek me, not because ye saw the miracles, but because ye did eat of the loaves and were filled. Labor not for the meat which perisheth, but for that meat which endureth unto everlasting life, which the Son of Man shall give unto you. For him hath God the Father sealed. Then said they unto him, What shall we do, that we might work the works of God? Jesus answered and said unto them, This is the work of God, that ye believe on him whom he hath sent. They said therefore unto him, What signs showest thou then, that we may see and believe thee? What dost thou work? Our fathers did eat manna in the desert, as it is written. He gave them bread from heaven to eat. Then Jesus said unto them, Verily, verily, I say unto you, Moses gave you not that bread from heaven, but my Father giveth you the true bread from heaven. For the bread of God is he which cometh down from heaven, and giveth life unto the world. Then said they unto him, Lord, evermore give us this bread. And Jesus said unto them, I am the bread of life. He that cometh to me shall never hunger, and he that believeth on me shall never thirst. 
But I said unto you that ye also have seen me, and believe not. All that the Father giveth me shall come to me, and him that cometh to me I will in no wise cast out. For I came down from heaven not to do mine own will, but the will of him that sent me. And this is the Father's will which hath sent me, that of all which he hath given me I should lose nothing, but should raise it up again at the last day. And this is the will of him that sent me, that every one which seeth the Son and believeth on him may have everlasting life, and I will raise him up at the last day. The Jews then murmured at him, because he said, I am the bread which came down from heaven. And they said, Is not this Jesus the son of Joseph, whose father and mother we know? How is it then that he saith, I came down from heaven? Jesus therefore answered and said unto them, Murmur not among yourselves. No man can come to me except the Father which hath sent me draw him, and I will raise him up at the last day. It is written in the prophets, And they shall be all taught of God. Every man therefore that hath heard, and hath learned of the Father, cometh unto me. Not that any man hath seen the Father, save he which is of God. He hath seen the Father. Verily, verily, I say unto you, he that believeth on me hath everlasting life. I am that bread of life. Your fathers did eat manna in the wilderness, and are dead. This is the bread which cometh down from heaven, that a man may eat thereof, and not die. I am the living bread which came down from heaven. If any man eat of this bread, he shall live for ever. And the bread that I will give is my flesh, which I will give for the life of the world. The Jews therefore strove among themselves, saying, How can this man give us his flesh to eat? Then Jesus said unto them, Verily I say unto you, Except ye eat the flesh of the Son of Man, and drink his blood, ye have no life in you. Whoso eateth my flesh, and drinketh my blood, hath eternal life, and I will raise him up at the last day. For my flesh is meat indeed, and my blood is drink indeed. He that eateth my flesh, and drinketh my blood, dwelleth in me, and I in him. As the living Father hath sent me, and I live by the Father. So he that eateth me, even he shall live by me. This is that bread which came down from heaven, not as your fathers did eat manna and are dead. He that eateth of this bread shall live for ever. These things said he in the synagogue as he taught in Capernaum. Many therefore of his disciples, when they had heard this, said, This is an hard saying. Who can hear it? When Jesus knew in himself that his disciples murmured at it, he said unto them, Doth this offend you? What and if ye shall see the Son of Man ascend up where he was before? It is the Spirit that quickeneth, the flesh profiteth nothing. The words that I speak unto you, they are spirit, and they are life. But there are some of you that believe not. For Jesus knew from the beginning who they were that believed not, and who should betray him? And he said, Therefore said I unto you, that no man can come unto me, except it were given unto him of my Father. From that time many of his disciples went back, and walked no more with him. Then said Jesus unto the twelve, Will ye also go away? Then Simon Peter answered him, Lord, to whom shall we go? Thou hast the words of eternal life. And we believe and are sure that thou art that Christ, the Son of the living God. Jesus answered them, Have not I chosen you twelve, and one of you is a devil? He spake of Judas Iscariot, the son of Simon, for he it was that should betray him, being one of the twelve. May God help us to be doers of the word. Amen.
Praise the Lord. Let's have a word of prayer. Father, we thank you for the Bible study tonight. We thank you for your goodness. Thank you for bringing us here. And thank you because your spirit will reveal your mind, your truth unto everyone. And we pray that the grace to be obedient to your word, every part of the word, will grant to everyone in Jesus' name. We're asking, Lord, that the word will be clear, the word will be applicable to every life, and everyone will have understanding in what you are revealing to us tonight in Jesus' name. We pray, Lord, that this word will continue to make impact in every life. I'll be moving forward, making progress in the things of the Lord and in every area of our lives in Jesus' name. We well, thank you because we know you have answered. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Welcome to our Bible study tonight. Tonight we are coming to 1 Corinthians chapter 4. And we are reading from verse 14. 1 Corinthians chapter 4. We are reading from verse 14. I write not these things to shame you. But as my sons, I warn you. Verse 15 For though ye have 10,000 instructors in Christ, ye have not many fathers. For in Christ Jesus, I have begotten you through the gospel. Verse 16 Wherefore I beseech you, be ye followers of me. For this cause have I sent unto you, Timothy, 
who is my beloved son I'm faithful in the Lord who shall bring you into remembrance of my ways which be in Christ as I teach everywhere in every church now some above all as though I will not come to you but I will come to you shortly if the Lord will and will know not the speech of them which are puffed up but the power for the kingdom of God is not a word but in power and then now the final verse verse 21 what will ye shall I come unto you with a rod or in love and in the spirit of meekness as we look at the passage today you find Paul the apostle talking to the believers at Corinth the church at Corinth and he wanted to bring them back to the foundation of their faith he wanted to remind them how they received the word how they were convicted by the word how that conviction led them to repentance and the repentance and faith in Christ led them to salvation and he wanted them to understand that because of that connection of the pastor to the people that had the word of God directly as a father in the faith as the one who has brought them out of sin into the unto the savior and unto salvation as the one who has brought to them revelation from heaven that made them to discover that they were sinners they couldn't save themselves only the power of the grace of God could save them he wanted them to understand the foundation of their faith he wanted them to understand how they came into the family of God and God became their father and Jesus became their savior and the Holy Spirit their helper reminding them and telling them that now they have come into the faith they have come into the kingdom they have come into the fold they were now the children of God but not only the children of God they became the sons and the daughters of Paul the apostle that's why he said by the grace of God he had brought them into the kingdom by the power of the gospel by the preaching of the gospel and the grace of God has transformed their lives and so they were sons in the faith and he was talking to them as their father and that's why he said they might have many instructors and many teachers and many counselors and many leaders but in the faith but in the Lord he was their father in the kingdom and that's why today he is talking to them and he's talking to us as well that the gospel has come to us through the writing of the apostle the message of salvation has come to us by the revelation that God gave unto the apostle as our father that is the father in the faith the people that had the gospel and the people that gave the gospel and the people that were faithful to the Lord and the word came to us and he wants us to understand that pastoral fatherhood of the apostle and then not only that in every church the Lord Jesus Christ gave some apostles he gave some pastors he gave some evangelists he gave some pastors and teachers so that the people of God will be developed and will be edified prepared for the coming of the Lord in every church there is a leader in every church there is a pastor in every church there is a father in the Lord that leads sinners to salvation and leads believers to their growth in Christ and he wants us to understand the benevolent ministry of pastoral fatherhood in every church that's what we are looking at today as we look at the uh, passage before us 
First Corinthians chapter 4, reading from verse 14 to verse 21, that we are bred the benevolent ministry, the beneficial ministry, and the ministry that blesses the church and blesses every member through the pastoral fatherhood of those leaders in every church in your own local church in our church and at the headquarters here there is that fatherhood pastoral fatherhood of the ministry in the church that ministers grace that ministers strength that ministers understanding that ministers revelation to every member of the church he wants us to recognize that so that our benefit in the gospel will continue yours will continue in jesus name as we look at the message today we're divided into three parts number one paul's ministry beyond that of ten thousand teachers paul's ministry pastoral ministry beyond that of ten thousand teachers number two the purposeful mission of teachable trustworthy timothy he introduced timothy to them and he said timothy was a beloved son and timothy was a faithful son timothy was a faithful servant of god and as he came to them or as he will come to them they ought to receive the ministry of timothy because he has a mission because he has a purposeful mission being teachable and trustworthy number three is the parental mindfulness matched by tender top thoroughness as you look at paul the apostle paul the apostle as a father will be tender because he will say that he came to them like a nursing mother is tender over them is tender over the base but then when he needs to become tough he'll be tough because he needed to take away the carnality the sinfulness and the evil and the backsliding from the lives of the people that were backsliding on the one hand he was tender on the other hand when he needed to be said tough he was tough with them but through it all whether at the time he was tender or at the time he was tough he was thorough he preached the word of god thoroughly he spoke about repentance he spoke about salvation faith in christ he spoke about the life that a new creature a child of god ought to live he spoke about peace with all men and holiness without which no man shall see the lord he spoke in such a way that the members of the church the people at corinth and the people everywhere they will take the word of god to heart and prepare to meet the Lord in heaven. What an example for every preacher. What an example for every teacher of the word. And what an example for every pastor. You ought to be tender when you're dealing with babes in Christ. You ought to be tough when you're dealing with people who are forever learning and never able to come to the knowledge of the truth. But whether you are tender or tough, you must be thorough all the time. Parental mindfulness marked by tender, tough thoroughness. We're coming to point number one now. Point number one is Paul's ministry beyond that of 10,000 teachers. We're coming back to 1 Corinthians chapter 4, and I'm reading from verse 14. Please open your Bible. 1 Corinthians chapter 4, reading from verse 14. I write not these things to shame you. That is, all you had been writing to correct them, all you had been writing to point out their carnality and their division and their strife. He said, I'm not writing that to put you to shame, but as my beloved sons, I warn you, he was warning them against corruption in their lives, against carnality in their lives, and against all the compromises that were coming into their lives. He said, as a father, and you are my beloved sons, I warn every one of you. And then he says in verse 15, he says, for though ye have 
10,000 instructors, 10,000 teachers, and 10,000 counselors, and 10,000 helpers in Christ. Yet ye have, have ye not many fathers? He says, You have only one father in the natural you have only one father in your family you have only one father you cannot have two fathers but you can have many teachers primary school many teachers in the secondary school many tutors in the university many tutors and teachers all through life many counselors many coaches people that can train you and coach you but when it comes to being born into this life you have just one father he says ye have not many fathers for in christ jesus i have begotten you by the gospel or through the gospel and then in verse 16 it says wherefore i beseech you be ye followers of me three things we're looking at number one the uniqueness of pioneering paul above ten thousand teachers the uniqueness of the apostle the uniqueness of Paul because he was a pioneer he gave the word of God they had never heard the gospel they never knew the way of salvation and the way of the Lord had never been revealed to them and then he came as a foundation preacher he came as a pioneering evangelist and he brought the gospel unto them the uniqueness of pioneering Paul above 10,000 teachers number two the usefulness of Paul's passion the usefulness of Paul's passion in tenacious temperate teachers that is the people now who are teaching and the people now that Paul the apostle is serving as an example is serving an example for us it was tenacious it was temperate and it taught the word of God without fear and without favor it taught the word of God faithfully he taught the word of God persuasively. He taught the word of God fearlessly. And it becomes a pattern for us. It becomes an example for us. Number three is the universality of Paul's pattern for truly transform, transformed temples. He calls us the temple of God. He says, don't you know that you are the temple of God and that the Holy Spirit dwells in you, abides in you, and now it becomes a pattern for us. And the pattern is universal, not only for the church at Corinth, but for the church in Colossae and the church in Ephesus and the church all over the places he went and the church alive today the church getting ready for the coming of the Lord where the temples of the Holy Ghost and were transformed and were teachable and were receptive and were faithful and we practice what we're learning and Paul the Apostle becomes then a universal pattern for us let's look at number one there is the uniqueness of pioneering paul above ten thousand teachers look at verse 15 again in first corinthians chapter 4 reading from verse 15 but though ye have ten thousand instructors or teachers in christ yet have ye not many fathers for in christ jesus i not I and Apollos, I, not I and Sebas, I, not I and other teachers, I single-handedly, the Lord sent him to Corinth and he preached the word of God to them, I have begotten you through the gospel. That's unique. As you look at Second Samuel chapter 18, reading from verse 3, Second Samuel chapter 18, reading from verse 3 we're told about david the people told david they said here is the value here is the evolution because it was the prince over them it was the king over them it was the one anointed by god to fulfill the will of god i have found david the son of jesse 
who shall fulfill all my will. And because of that, they knew the value that he was a pioneering person apart from, apart from Saul, besides Saul, he was to lead the children of Israel spiritually and physically and nationally he was to lead them to be at the very center of God but the people answered thou shalt not go forth that's going forth to battle for if we, if we flee away they will not care for us neither if half of us die will they care for us but now look at this but now thou David but now thou our king but now thou the pioneering psalmist now thou that will bring in the Lord Jesus Christ through your lineage now thou art worth 10,000 of us no Israelites recognize the volume that and the wage and the great sin the Lord had imparted and put in David to help the nation and they said thou art worth 10,000 of us therefore now it is better that thou succor us out of the city we're coming to Acts chapter 9 verse 15 Acts chapter 9 verse 15 but the Lord said unto him go thy way for he is a chosen vessel unto me. God was talking to Ananias concerning Paul the Apostle. He said, you go and lay hands on, on uh, Paul the Apostle. And when Ananias was again, how can I do that? This man is an injurious person. The Lord said, he's transformed, he's changed, he's now my servant. Go thy way, for he is a chosen vessel unto me to bear my name before the Gentiles, to bear my name before the Gentiles and before kings and the children of Israel. You will notice something there that his ministry was extensive. His calling was wide. His calling was great. The apostles and the other apostles like Peter, like James, like John, like all those others he ministered in Jerusalem and they were ministering to the Jews in particular to the children of Israel but the Lord said I am choosing him I am appointing him I'm sending him forth to bear my name to the Gentiles before the Gentiles and even before kings and before the children of Israel that's why the Lord gave him the depth and the height of the riches of the gospel in Ephesians chapter 3 looking at verse 3 Ephesians chapter 3 verse 3 how that by revelation he made known unto me the mystery as I wrote afore in few words understand there were things revealed to Paul the apostle that even Peter did, did not have such revelation and that's why as you look at the New Testament you will see in all the epistles uh, Peter wrote a two and John wrote three and then plus the revelation and Jude wrote one and James wrote one but Paul the apostle the Lord revealed to him all the things that the new creature in Christ ought to know of the new dispensation of the new covenant and he wrote in uh, he wrote in the romans and first corinthians second corinthians and he wrote in galatians and then he came to ephesians and philippians and colossians and fourth Thessalonians and second thessalonians and first timothy second timothy and titus and then he wrote a philemon and he wrote the hebrews and you see the revelation the lord gave him he was unique and he was peculiar and the lord gave him to the church as a unique pioneer a unique preacher of the word of God and the depths of the things of God look at verse 4 there in verse 4 it says whereby when you read ye may understand my knowledge in the mystery of Christ look at verse 5 in verse 5 which in other ages was not made known unto the sons of men the revelation God gave Paul the apostle in all the other ages Ages, the Lord did not make known, known to the uh, sons of men. What does that mean? Moses did not have all the revelation 
given to Paul. Joshua did not have all the revelation given to Paul the apostle. Even David did not have all the revelation given to Paul the apostle. Mention all the prophets, Isaiah, Jeremiah, Ezekiel, Daniel, and then Hosea and Amos and Joel. All those prophets, they did not have the revelation, deep revelation, on such a more riches of the kingdom that God gave Paul the apostle. That's why it says that God has made known now what was not known before as it is now revealed unto his holy apostles and prophets at this at this time by the spirit and then he says in verse 6 he says that the gentiles shall be fellow heirs and of the same body and partakers of his promise in christ by the gospel the gospel revealed unto paul the apostle was so full was so deep, was so great, was so high, was so universal that Paul the Apostle wanted the, the uh, believers at Corinth, he wanted them to understand so that they will not just uh, say, well, are they not all the same Paul or Apollos or Sivas or Moses or Daniel or David? Are they not all the same? He said, no what the lord has revealed today is greater is higher and is deeper than what all those other people ever had and it says in verse 7 in verse 7 wherefore i was made a minister it comes now personal he needed to make this known to the churches so that they will know his appointment, his anointing, his assignment came from the Lord directly. Wherefore, I was made a minister according to the gift of the grace of God given unto me by the factual working of his power. Look at verse 8. In verse 8, he now says unto me, Unto me, Paul, unto me, Paul the Apostle, unto me, who am less than the least of all saints, is this grace given that I, Paul, that I, the Apostle Paul, should preach among the Gentiles. Look at this, the unsearchable riches of Christ. That he, Paul, by the uniqueness of his calling and the uniqueness of his ministry, shall reveal unto the church the unsearchable riches of Christ. Let's come to number two here. Number two is the usefulness of Paul's passion. The, the usefulness of Paul's passion. It says, when you look at Paul, you look at his zeal, you're not just to look at him and say, well, that's Paul. You look at his passion. You're not just to look at him and say, well, that's Paul. And you look at his commitment, his uncompromising stand, anytime, every time, anywhere, everywhere. He comes to us useful. That passion is to help us to become as tenacious as he was, as thorough as he was, and as um, tender-hearted as he was, so that we too will be teachers who are temperate, and teachers who are tenacious, and teachers who are compromising, and teachers who stand on the word and will not compromise. Look at uh, what he says in First Corinthians chapter 4, reading from verse 14, I write these things not to shame you, I write not to shame you, not to make you feel discouraged, I write to instruct you. I write to brush you up. I write to enlighten you. I write to build you up, lift you up, and make you have the right understanding. But as my beloved sons, I warn you. And then in verse 15, it says, For though ye have 10,000 instructors in Christ, ye have not many fathers. For in Christ Jesus, I have begotten you through the gospel. It tells us in Acts of the Apostles, chapter 14, Acts chapter 14, we're reading from verse 22. It says, confirming the souls of the apostles and exhorting them. Confirming the souls of the apostles and exhorting them. It wasn't just an evangelist to bring the people to Christ. He staged there. He appointed leaders. He instructed leaders. He trained leaders. And he was instructing them to continue in the faith. 
that we must through through much tribulation much persecution much trouble enter into the kingdom of god that's what he did and he did that to encourage the people he did that to form to and to train the people he did that to develop the people and the lord wants us to understand today that paul the apostle was not just a pattern for them in his passion he is a pattern for us too in his passion in everything that he has done now the example he has given us and how we need to follow through look at uh, chapter 12 of romans romans chapter 12 uh, reading now from verse 6 in romans chapter 12 verse 6 it says having then gives differing uh, according to the grace that is given to us you are now maybe you are a pastor now in your own in your own corner there maybe you're a teacher of the word of god in your own corner there maybe you're an evangelist a soul winner maybe you are working among the women or among the children among the campus and maybe you are working among the youth anywhere you are now we have differing gifts according to the grace that is given to us whether prophecy let us prophesy according to the proportion of faith it says i've shown you the example I've shown you the pattern and I've shown you the purpose. I've shown you the, the, the pattern that you ought to follow and the pungency and the pointedness with which I have done, with which I've carried out my own ministry. Are you called in the ministry? Are you appointed in the ministry? Are you given an assignment to do? Look at Paul and look at the usefulness of his passion, of his example, and follow through and do the same. And prophesy according to the proportion of faith in verse 7 it says so ministry let us wage on a ministry he said i've shown you the example i've shown you the pattern i've shown you the zeal you ought to manifest don't be an absent minister don't be an absent shepherd don't be an absent preacher be there and wage on your ministry or he the teaches on teaching on that on that gift that you have improve on that gift that you have and make sure that you are sharpening your iron every time and you are able to now speak persuasively and you are able to speak pungently you are able to speak in a way that will bring conviction in the hearts of the people you're speaking to wait on your ministry and develop all the talents and all the gifts that you have he tells us in verse 8 it says in verse 8 or he that exhorted on exhortation don't cross over and do what others are supposed to be doing you are a pastor you are a teacher you are a counselor you are an exhorter and whatever it is the lord has given you improve on that and wait on that exhortation or he that giveth let him do it with simplicity he that ruleth with diligence and he that showeth mercy with cheerfulness that's the instruction he has given us and that is what we need to do so that we can grow in our ministry we can grow in our appointment he tells us in first corinthians chapter 9 verse 25 first corinthians chapter 9 verse 25 and every man that striveth for the mastery every man that striveth is not talking about striving for mundane things is talking about the ministry god has given us and you see you need to practice and practice and practice you need to prepare and prepare and prepare you need to exercise uh, those gifts and you need to concentrate on them and you need to take every opportunity and make sure that you are doing what you are called to do because you are striving for mastery you are temperate in all things anything that will not help you to develop anything that will not help you to have the impact you ought to have you will sh sh throw that aside so that you'll be temperate in all things it says now they do it to obtain those athletes they do that to obtain a corruptible crown but we an incorruptible and then in verse 26 it says i therefore so run it says i don't limp 
He says, I don't wobble. He says, I'm not an indecisive person. A person that cannot decide, should I, should I not, should I run, should I walk, should I wait, should I hold on? He said, I run. And I so run. He's telling us, he gives us an example that as you have the ministry, as the Lord has committed much into your hand, he says, I run. And it's an example for you, not as uncertainly, so fight I, not as one that beateth the air. How do you do it? Paul, in verse 27, he says, but I keep my body under I keep my body under. What does that mean? It says, I watch what I eat. I watch what I drink. I bring my body in condition. Like those athletes, those athletes, they have to make sure that they are not overweight. They need to make sure that they do not eat things that will disqualify them or weaken them for the race they need to run. It says in the same way as a preacher, in the same way as an apostle, I keep my body under. I don't feed my body with something that will make my body weak and my body so flabby that I cannot stand and I cannot run and I cannot do what the Lord has called me to do. I watch the sleeping, I watch the waking, I watch the movement and I watch to have sharp eyesight, I watch my mind, I watch everything so that all the faculties I need to keep me suitable and fit for the work the Lord has given me and make sure that everything is intact. That's why he says, but I keep my body under. I don't help Timothy to keep his body under. I cannot help Titus to keep his own body under. I cannot help another person. I cannot help Aquila Priscilla to keep their body under. I do it for myself so that I can be the best I ought to be in the work of the Lord. The same thing is handing over to you. That you look at what God has given you. The calling God has given you. You look at the assignment the Lord has giving you and then you are not trying to keep other people on them and you're not trying to control other people you control your own self what you eat what you drink how you sleep how you wake how you read how you pray how you intercede how you do everything the lord has called you to do you keep yourself under control so that the work of god will prosper in your hand this work will prosper in your hand I said the work of God will prosper in your hand. But I keep my body under and bring it into subjection. What is seen there is I'm in control of my body. My body is not controlling me. That is, my body cannot say, drink alcohol and then force me. I, don't, I can't accept that. My body cannot say, look at that thing, uh, pornography, and my body will have the victory over me. And I'll not, he said, I'm in control. My spirit is in control of my body. He says, I bring it into subjection, lest that by any means, when I preach to others, I myself should be a cast away. You will not be a cast away in Jesus' name. Number three now, number three is the universality of Paul's pattern for truly transformed temples. We're temples and we're temples of God. And he says it's a pattern for us. It's a model for us. It's an example for us. And what we read of him and what we learn of him, the way we're instructed about his life, the practicality. The practical things that he did that will take that one by one if possible leads them out and say yes that's also in my life yes that's also in my life this other one i'm working at that i need to work on that one until the pattern of the life and the ministry and the commitment and the consecration of paul the apostle will be reflected in my life the universality of paul's pattern for truly transformed temples that's why he says in first corinthians chapter 4 verse 16 it says wherefore i beseech you 
all you Corinthians don't say I'm not an apostle therefore I beseech you all you Christians don't say I'm not a pastor wherefore I beseech you be ye followers of me be ye followers of me he had grace and was able to stand he had grace he was able to do the will of god without making any exception he says you too can because i i am what i am by the grace of god you too can be who you ought to be by the grace of god therefore be ye followers of me he says in chapter 11 verse 1 chapter 11 verse 1 he says to those corinthians he said be ye followers of me even as i also am of christ he says every time i have jesus christ at the forerunner before me and i'm following after the footsteps of jesus christ and the same grace i have to follow after the footsteps of jesus you too should have that same grace and be ye followers of me even so even as i am a follower of the lord jesus christ the power and the strength and the ability to be the follower of the lord jesus christ as paul the apostle had given unto you in jesus name we're looking at, uh, at philippians chapter 3 verse 17 in philippians chapter 3 verse 17 it says brethren be ye followers together of me it's not just saying because you're a pastor because you're an apostle but because you're a brother because you're a sister because you're a child of god he says brethren everyone that names the name of christ everyone that is a real child of god you are born again you are saved you are righteous by the calling of god you have repented you have believed on the lord jesus christ he says that's the reason why you need to look at the pattern i have said you need to look at the power and you need to look at the possibilities in paul's own life and be followers together of me and mark them which walk so as she have us for an example mark them don't mark the people that do not follow the example that do not follow the pattern that do not follow the model that abandoned the model the pattern the word of god and push that aside and then they follow their own mind and they follow something secular he says you mark them that walk so as she have us for an example i pray this same grace the lord will grant to every one of us in jesus name did i hear an amen from the floor there let's come to point number two now point number two we're coming to first corinthians chapter four and we're reading from verse 17 we're looking at first corinthians chapter four verse 17 that's the purposeful mission of teachable trustworthy timothy it tells us please open your bible in first corinthians chapter four verse 17 it says for this cause have i sent unto you timothy who is my beloved son and faithful in the lord who shall bring you into remembrance of my ways which be in christ as i teach everywhere in every church you understand what paul the apostle is saying there it says i go to many churches and i teach the way of the lord the will of god the word of god in every church and timothy has listened and timothy has prayed and timothy has internalized everything he has had and not only that timothy has also studied he has also learned and by prayer and intercession and by imposition of my hands he has the gift also he will come to you and i'm sending him to you he will tell you he will impart unto you all that he has learned is a beloved son and he is faithful in the lord and he will put you in remembrance of my ways of the word of god of the doctrine that i teach let's look at timothy now, number one the sending forth of trusted faithful timothy sending forth of trusted faithful timothy and we're looking at philippians chapter 2 
and we're reading from verse 19. Philippians chapter 2, and we're reading from verse 19. It says, But I trust in the Lord to send Timothy shortly unto you. Hold on. When the, when the apostle was talking to the Corinthians, he said, I'm sending Timothy unto you. Now he's talking to the Philippians. He said, I'm sending Timothy unto you. And when you read the first Thessalonians, he said, I also sent Timothy unto you. You understand that Timothy never said no to the call of God. He never said no to anything. His father in the Lord called the apostle, his instructor, what he told him to do. And here he said, I trust in the Lord and to send Timothy shortly unto you, that I also may be of good comfort when I know your stage. And then he says in verse 20, he says, for I have no man like-minded. Look at what he said about Timothy. Can the Lord say that about you? Can your local pastor say that about you? Can your group pastor say that about you? Can your region overseer, can your state overseer say that about you? Does the state overseer even know anything about you, even though you are under his leadership in the state? Does your region overseer know anything about you, even though you are under his leadership in the region? Are you the dodger? You are always dodging. And you're always, uh, you know, hiding somewhere so that I don't want them to know me. Because if they know you now and they know your quality and they know your ability, they will then pick on you and send you there, send you there. And if you say no, they will say, are you saved? Are you born again? If we send you there to go and do the work of God and you are not available, are you really a child of God? So I don't want any questioning and I don't want anybody to put any doubt in my mind. I just want to be an isolated hidden member of the church in the stage in the nation in the group in the district in the local church timothy was not like that he said for i have no man like-minded who will naturally care for your stage in verse 21 it says for all seek their own they're seeking their gain they're seeking their advantage they're seeking their profit for all seek their own not the things which are jesus christ in verse 22 it says but you know the proof of him that as a son with the father as a son with the father not as a slave having slavish fear not as uh, an eye service a servant like a civil servant only doing it when uh, you know the father the director the boss is there he says you know the proof of him that as a son with the father he has served with me in the gospel that's the life we ought to live the sending forth of trusted faithful timothy let's look at number two there Number two there is the selflessness of teachable, focused Timothy. As you look at Timothy, whatever he was sent to do, he was focused and he was faithful. And he was a person that will remain teachable. Go and do this. You see, there are people, they are not paying attention when you are giving instruction. And so, after they have led, they cannot even remember everything you have said. They were not paying attention. And if they didn't understand, they're not going to ask any question. And so, when they go to the field, they cannot carry out everything they're supposed to carry out. If you're going to be like a teachable Timothy, if you're going to be like a focused Timothy, when you are being given instruction, you will listen. And then when you listen, you will try to understand. And as you try to understand, you will ask questions before you leave or before you get away from the presence of the one giving you the instruction. Is this what you mean? Please uh, be patient with me. Let me repeat what you have said the way I understand. And then you repeat if there's anything to correct, if there's anything to adjust, if there's anything to add, if there's anything to say, no, that's not what I mean. This is what I mean. Then you understand. And then after you have heard, normally, 
the ministry is greater than the minister normally the challenge is greater than the son in the field that is going you will take all those instructions you will take all those things you have been told as a focused and teachable Timothy you take it to the Lord in prayer Lord help me to be faithful Lord help me to be fruitful Lord help me to concentrate on this and do it the way that Apostle Paul himself would have done it if he were the one to go on the field and then when you are there every time you are taking inventory after you've done a day a week a month then you reflect back or oh, when I came here as Paul the Apostle sent me he wanted me to accomplish this and accomplish this and as you take inventory have I done that have I done that have I done that you have a checklist as to what you should have done and the things that remain to be done you also now include them and then you're looking forward to when you'll get back to Paul the Apostle and give a full report what you told me to do what you sent me to do I heard I learned I internalized I prayed I had the great of God and this is what I have done and so Paul the Apostle will be able to say you know the proof of him that as a son with the father he has served with me in the gospel look at first Corinthians chapter 16 reading from verse 10 first Corinthians chapter 16 reading from verse 10 now if Timothy come see that he be see that he may be with you without fear if timothy comes to you like i can come to you paul the apostle as your father in the lord and i declare the truth of god to you and i'm fearless because you are my children and i'm faithful because you are my children and i look at you face to face and courageously i declare the mind of god to you now timothy is coming to you he is much younger than i am i'm sending him to you when he comes the way you receive me the apostle paul that's the way you receive him so that he will be with you without fear look at this look at this second part of that verse for he walketh the work of the lord as i also do did i preach repentance is going to preach repentance did i preach restitution is going to preach restitution did i preach faith in christ and salvation in christ is going to preach faith in christ and salvation in christ did i preach sanctification holiness without which no man shall say the lord is going to preach exactly the same thing did i walk hard and did i walk with all my heart all my soul sweating and still walking is going to do the same thing is going to have the same attitude the same consecration and the same commitment because he walks the work of the lord as i also do let's come to number three now number three there is uh, the the useful we've we'll talked about the uh, still worship and we've we'll talked number three of this point number two as we look at this we're looking at the stewardship now of truthful fruitful timothy timothy was fruitful because he had the instruction he had the pattern everything that he ought to do and he did it just like paul the apostle expected we're coming to first corinthians chapter 4 and we're reading from verse 17 in first corinthians chapter 4 verse 17 it says for this cause have i said unto you timothy who is my beloved son who is my beloved son i can recommend him without reservation he is my beloved son and is faithful in the lord who shall bring you into remembrance of all my ways which be in christ as i teach everywhere in every church as we look at uh, timothy number one he did the work of a pastor number two he did the work of a teacher number three he did the work of an evangelist number four number four he did the work of a trainer training other people he was an approved workman unto the lord look at first timothy chapter one verse three 
in first timothy chapter one verse three it says as i besought thee he's talking to timothy because it's first timothy as i besought thee timothy to abide still at ephesus when i went into macedonia that thou mightest charge some that they teach no other doctrine he was now to be at ephesus look at this timothy you know sometimes you wonder that a person like this uh, that is uh, timothy he was sent to corinth he went and came back philippi he went and he came back thessalonica he went and he came back and now he's sent to ephesus and he's sent there to abide there now and to be a pastor there and timothy never said no and Timothy never said, I don't understand, so and so is there, such and such is, uh, is also there, and I'm the one to go here, go here, go there, go there. His son does not act like that, and does not talk like that. He was a pastor. Look at uh, now, he was a teacher in First Timothy chapter 4, reading from verse 11. First Timothy chapter 4, reading from verse 11, these things command and teach that's first timothy is still talking to timothy and then in verse 12 it says let no man despise the youth but be thou an example of the believers in word in conversation in charity in spirit in faith and in purity a pastor number one a teacher number two he was an evangelist look at second timothy chapter four we're reading from verse five second timothy chapter four reading from verse five he says do the work but watch thou in all things endure affliction do the work of an evangelist make full proof of thy ministry here paul the apostle was saying when he needed a pastor in ephesus Timothy go there and then he needed a teacher that would teach them in Corinth, Timothy, go there and he needed an evangelist and he said, Timothy, don't forget don't allow the pastoral work and don't allow the teaching ministry to swallow up your evangelistic outreach, do the work of an evangelist it was also to train other people, bring up other people that they will continue and do the work of the Lord along with him. Look at 2 Timothy chapter 2. We're looking at verse 2. 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 2. And the things that thou hast heard of me among many witnesses, the same commit thou to faithful men who shall be able to teach others also. Everything you have heard, pass it on. Everything you have learned, pass it on. Every training you have got, pass it on. Every conviction you have, pass it on. And every commitment, consecration, everything you are doing, not just for you to do the work of a hundred men, take those hundred people, bring them up and train them and school them and coach them and reform them, refine them so that they can also take part in the work with you make sure they are faithful and make sure they are available make sure they are teachable and make sure that they have the ability to teach and to pass on what they have learned and then he ought to be an approved workman he tells us in second timothy chapter 2 reading from verse 15 in chapter 2 verse 15 it says study to show thyself he's talking to timothy and he's talking to you study to show thyself approved unto god a workman not a lazy man a workman not a sleeping man a workman not a roaming not a roving man a workman not somebody just loafing a workman you wake up in the morning there is something to do for the kingdom of god be a workman and then you're living in that community many of them need to have the ministry of the evangelist open your eyes and look on the fields for their white already to harvest and be a workman and then there are young people there to teach and to put in the way of righteousness 
be a workman. There are women there to hear the gospel and to know how they need to behave in their personal lives, how they need to behave in their families, how to take care of their husbands, how to take care of their children. That is what be a teacher of the word of God that will develop those women be a workman and then there is a church to pastor and the people need to be solid and sound in the teaching of the word of God work and develop that work and make sure that you are a workman approved unto God you are not ashamed rightly dividing the word of truth we we'll come to point number three now in point number three we're looking at parental mindfulness match by tender of thoroughness parental mindfulness match by tender tough thoroughness we're coming back to first corinthians chapter 4 and we're looking at verse 18 first corinthians chapter 4 we're looking at verse 18 now some are puffed up as though i would not come to you in verse 19 he tells us but i will come to you shortly if the lord will i will come to you shortly if the lord will hold on he was sending timothy to them and he was sending timothy and he said timothy walks the work of god as i do he said timothy is dependable timothy is faithful and timothy will bring to you all the ways that i teach as i teach everywhere in every church but he did not abdicate his own responsibility he didn't say timothy is there i can go to sleep titus is there i can be resting and then he didn't say epaphroditus all those people are there and i can send them here send them here send them here and he now sees i have all those people to send everywhere i don't have to do anything he said no i'm sending them not because i'm retiring I'm sending them, not because I retreat. I'm sending them, not because I want to have a chance to be idle. I'm sending them, and yet I myself, I will come, I will come, I will come to you shortly, if the Lord will, and will know not the speech of them which are puffed up, but the power. You know, the Corinthians have been proud and puffed up in his absence in the absence of paul the apostle there are some preachers there are some pastors when you see that you know some people like that they are now outgrown they are overgrown their own intelligence and they have overgrown the level of learning they have become proud and they show that in their attitude then they become fearful i can't go to those people because they think they know it all and they are proud and they can manifest that pride against me paul the apostle was not beaten back and paul the apostle was not chased away from the ministry the lord had given to him just because some people manifested pride or they manifested disobedience or rebellion he still went he said i'm coming and when i come there i will know not their speech even though they are popped up but i will know their power and then he tells us about the gospel in verse 20 for the kingdom of god is not in word that is it's not in word only but in power in verse 21 now he's asking them what do you want what will you shall i come unto you with a rod like a real master and like a real father to discipline those who have gone wrong or i come in love with affection to gather you together and to teach you those unsearchable riches of the kingdom of god or should i come in the spirit of meekness we're looking at three things number one the empty pride of some carnal corinthians some of the Corinthians manifested empty pride. Pride that had no stuff. Pride that had no substance. Pride that had no revelation and no knowledge. Pride that didn't help them to walk in the way of the Lord. Empty pride of some carnal Corinthians. Number two, the evident power of steadfast, consecrated Christians. Christians who are saved. 
Christians who are sanctified, Christians who are filled with the Holy Ghost and they have the evident power of steadfast, consecrated believers, Christians. And then number three, the express purpose of the shepherd's continual coming. He wants to come. Why? He wants to come. What's he coming to do? He wants to come. What's he going to achieve? The express purpose of the shepherd's continual coming. Let's look at number one, the empty pride <clears throat> of some canal Corinthians. Look at it again in 1 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 18. Now, some are puffed up as though I would not come unto you. Now, when it says some are puffed up, you know those who a big bread they have to put yeast to make it swell up that yeast is leaven and when you put that leaven that thing will be puffed up you see those people they have the leaven of righteousness the leaven of compromise the leaven of envy and the leaven of uh, false self-esteem and when they add that leaven in them it made them to puff up like bread and it says now some of you you have the leaven in you you have the evil in you and you're puffed up as if as though i will not come to you and then in verse 19 in verse 19 but i will come to you shortly if the lord will that's good for every believer if the lord will there are people anything they say i determine to do this i determine to go there i determine to handle that they don't understand if the lord will the lord is the author of life and the lord is the author and the giver of life the author and the and the, and the supporter of life if the Lord will, if, that's, if that is the will of God for me, if that is the timetable of God for me, if that is the next thing the Lord will have me do, then I will come to you shortly. If the Lord will, I will know not the speech of them which are puffed up, not the speech of them who are boastful, not the uh, speech of them who are bragging. I want to know the power. Do they have the power to overcome sin? That's what I want to know. Do they have the power to overcome temptation? That's what I want to know. Do they have the power to claim the promises of God and stand firm on the promises of God? That's what I want to know. Do they have the power of purity to be pure in their heart and pure in their soul? The power of a sanctified life? That's what I want to know. Do they have the power of the Holy Ghost in them to declare the word of God? Or are they just in a little corner? in the confinement of the four walls of their local church building and then they are bragging and boasting if they have the power of the holy ghost let them come out and be a witness unto christ in jerusalem in judea in samaria and to the uttermost part of the earth in their community let them come out and manifest that power we don't want to hear the bragging of a boastful person or want to know the power they have over sin, over self, over Satan and the society, over sickness. Let's know the power. And then he tells us in chapter 5, that is 1 Corinthians chapter 5, looking at verse 2, it says in verse 2, but she had puffed up. I'm surprised you Corinthians, you're not looking at the essential scene. You need to look at ye are puffed up and have not rather mourned. When you ought to be crying, you are laughing. When you ought to be mourning, you are happy. And when you ought to be sober, you ought to be sinking, you're flippant and you are frivolous. It says you are puffed up and you have not rather mourned that he that has done this deed might be taken away from among you. He was telling them there is nothing to be proud of. 
they should look at their lives and look at what they do not have which they ought to have and get on their knees and have the power of God in their lives and then they come out in that power of the Lord and they're able to do what the Lord has appointed for them to do look at point number two there in number two is the evident power of steadfast consecrated Christians evident power of steadfast consecrated Christians now understand that word steadfast there are people that when they hear the word of God they at the spur of the moment they can shoot up like a star and then the following day everything is cold the following day they are now down today they are on top of the mountain today they are shining like a star on the in the sky but then tomorrow all the sin has whistled away but we're talking about the power of somebody who is steadfast that when he hears the word of God he takes that word on his knees he takes that word to the Lord in prayer he says Lord I don't want a temporary sin I don't want a temporary excitement I want you to turn me around I want you to do a great work of grace in my heart so that I'll become a consecrated Christian I'll become a steadfastly consecrated Christian and when you see me another week another month that fire I received at the altar in that Bible study and that fervency I received and that zeal I received at that time will still continue with me that's what we're talking about the evident power of steadfast consecrated Christian and look at verse 20 there in first Corinthians chapter 4 it says in verse 24 the kingdom of God is not a word entering the kingdom of God by salvation except a man be born again he cannot see he cannot enter the kingdom of God that kingdom of God is not in word but in power and then you are, you are now in the kingdom you abide in the kingdom you plunge yourself into the depth of the provision of that kingdom and then you are steadfast in righteousness you are steadfast in holiness and then you go further you want to have the power of the kingdom because the kingdom of God is not in watch only it is in power and then you tarry there you abide there you wait there until you endure with power from on high and then the power envelopes you and the power saturates you and you're able to move back to your community not in fear not in fainting and not a wobbly wondering what am i going to do that's a difficult place you now go with strength you now go with assurance you now go with power the power of the kingdom has entered into you and then you become consistent with that you are consecrated to the lord and you are steadfast in the lord look at romans chapter 14 verse 17 romans <coughs> Romans chapter 14 verse 17 for the kingdom of God is not meat and drink but righteousness and peace and joy in the Holy Ghost the kingdom of God you enter the kingdom and you're joyful all the time the joy of the Lord is your strength whatever is happening in your community whatever noise whatever with whatever storm because you have the Holy Ghost within you and you have entered the kingdom you have the joy in the kingdom the joy in the Holy Ghost and you have peace in your heart whatever people say if people tell lies against you if people ridicule you what they say your peace is not hanging on the neck of anyone your peace is not in the mouth of anyone your peace is not in the action of anyone your peace is coming directly from the Holy Ghost and because you have the Holy Ghost whatever they say whatever they do however they act whatever thing may be happening around you have the joy in the Holy Ghost and you have the peace in the Holy Ghost and then righteousness at a time of temptation that righteousness will remain there at a time of challenge 
challenges, all that righteousness will remain there anytime, every time, anywhere, everywhere, because you have entered into the kingdom and the power of the kingdom, the joy, the righteousness, the peace of the kingdom is with you all the time. You are steadfast, you are consecrated as a Christian. And anybody that sees you will see the evidence of that power. In 2 Timothy chapter 1 verse 7, 2 Timothy chapter 1, reading there from verse 7, 2 Timothy chapter 1, reading from verse 7, it says in 2 Timothy chapter 1, verse 7, it says, For God has not given us the spirit of fear, when you are born again, you have the spirit of God and the Lord has not given you the spirit of fear. Now you move forward, you are sanctified and you don't uh, you know, go from faith to fear, but you go from faith to faith and the spirit of God will not allow you to be panicking and fearful and timid. It says, for God has not given us the spirit of fear. And then when you say you are saved, you are sanctified, you are baptized in the Holy Ghost, that Holy Holy Ghost baptism will infuse, will impart the faith and the power and the confidence in you. You'll not say I'm baptized in the Holy Ghost, but I'm afraid of the wind, I'm afraid of the cockroach, I'm afraid of that old woman, I'm afraid of that old man, I'm afraid of the village. What is the power of the Holy Ghost? When you're saved, you're sanctified, you're baptized in the Holy Ghost, you have power. For God has not given us the spirit of fear, but of power. Somebody shout Amen. amen. And of love, another Amen. amen. And of a sound mind. Of a sound mind. God bless you. You understand? When we're baptized in the Holy Ghost, I hear some people, they say, I was baptized in the Holy Ghost, and then I had mental problem. I couldn't control my mind. Everything was just flying here and there. The moment when I was saved, everything was all right. When I was sanctified, everything was all right. Now I was baptized in the Holy Ghost, and then I have mental problem. That's not baptism in the Holy Ghost. When you are baptized in the Holy Ghost, it's the spirit of power and the spirit of love and the spirit of a sound mind. All that uh, uh, distraction of the devil and mental problem get away from every life in Jesus' name. <laughs> number three now, number three is the express purpose of the shepherd's continued coming. He says he's coming. He wants to come unto the Corinthians and he wants to come. He has a purpose why he wants to come and come and come again. And the purpose of our coming with preachers, our coming with overseers, our coming with apostles, the purpose of our coming into your family and coming unto you, that purpose will be fulfilled in Jesus' name. When we come, light will come. When we come, power will come. When we come, more authority will come in your life. When we come, more anointing will come in your life. When we come, the riches of glory and the riches of heaven will come more into your life in Jesus' name. Whatever you have not got as we come to you and you come to us, you will have. And you have come today. And I have come to you today. And the revelation is coming to you today. And the anointing is coming to you today. Every power of darkness will vanish away. I come to you today in the anointing of the Lord. And every and the anointing will break every yoke in your life in Jesus' name. There is an express purpose of the shepherd's continual coming in your life. Today will be a new experience in your life in Jesus' name. Look at Romans, Romans chapter 1, we're reading from verse 10. Romans chapter 1, and we're looking at verse 10, making requests if by any means now at least I might have a prosperous journey by the will of God to come unto you. Did he say amen to that? Have a prosperous journey by the will of God to come to your district, to come to your group, 
and to come to your region and to come to your stage and to come to your nation look at verse 11 in verse 11 for i long to see you that i may impart some spiritual gift to the end he may be established to impart to impart spiritual gift to the end for the purpose he may be established brother sister here tonight boy girl here tonight the goodness of god will be established in your life and you will be established in the goodness of god in the grace of god in jesus name the word of god has come to you today the apostle paul has come to you today and has revealed these unsearchable riches unto you and i pray there'll be an impartation in your life tonight before you go i pray you'll be established you'll be established in your work you'll be established in the ministry you'll be established in your family you'll be established in all the goodness of god in your life in jesus name i will be established i said i will be established an impartation will come upon your life before you leave tonight let's rise up now and take all that to the lord in prayer oh lord i come today oh lord your revelation has come to me today oh lord these unsearchable riches have come to me today i accept i believe i receive an impartation in my life if you are not born again let the impartation of the lord come to you and make you repent and turn to the lord if you are saved you are not sanctified the impartation is coming now now, let it come to you and get sanctified if you have been sanctified hey the power of the holy ghost is here tonight let there be an impartation in your life that you receive power after the holy ghost has come upon you and then you'll be witnesses both in jerusalem and in judea and in samaria and to the uttermost part of the earth let the impartation come to you today if you're weak the impartation will make you strong if you're confused the impartation will get you established whatever it is you need of the grace of God of the goodness of God of the power of God let impartation come upon you today and be established in the faith established in the goodness of God established in all the revelation of the unsearchable riches of the kingdom of God get something before you go and the Lord himself will make sure that you establish in the faith for the rest of your life you'll never be the same again